Hello everyone. Today I would like to share a technique with you for making foliage that I figured out recently while making these trees for a game that I'm working on. So the really cool thing about this technique is that I didn't actually place any of these cards by hand, uh, nor did I use any specialized third-party software in order to do any complex setup for this. So the way that this technique works is that I've got this mesh that I made for the tree and the shader takes each of these quads and it effectively turns them into a billboard. For this tutorial, I will show you how we set up the content to work with this technique and also how we do this camera facing shader. Uh, I won't have time to go through how we set up the wind and the lighting effect for these, but uh, hopefully this should give you a good start. I will be using Amplify Shader inside of Unity, but if you're using Unity Shader Graph, for instance, or maybe Unreal, uh, I hope this should translate fairly well. So let's start by jumping into our 3D software to see how we set up the model for this. I've uh, got my tree model here inside of my 3D software, and as you can see, this is not a very complex model. There are, however, a few things we need to make sure of if we want this to work well with this billboard approach. And the first one being that we want the model to consist out of equally distributed quads, meaning polygons with four corners on it. And in theory, we could do this with triangles as well, but the nice thing about a quad is that it maps nicely to the to use the entire texture space. Um, and secondly, and more importantly, we need to make sure that each of these quads use the entire UV space, and I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I open up the tree inside of my UV view, and uh, let's just uh, isolate this. So we only have the tree crown here. Uh, as you can see, each of these quads fill up the entire UV space here. So from zero to one, we fill out this entire thing. So each of these uses up the entire thing. And another thing that I've noticed gives a lot nicer result is to use hard edges on this model. We could do this with uh, without going for hard edges, but I've noticed that each billboard gets a single light value. If we make this a soft mesh, uh, each of the vertices will receive slightly different shading. So having the hard edges kind of helps give um, each billboard a more representative light. Uh, there is also no extra cost involved since we're already splitting each quad uh, by the UVs, so this hard edge won't actually add any extra vertices for us. So in order to create a mesh like this, uh, there are two approaches that I would recommend for doing this. The first one, if you're doing it inside of a 3D program, I would use subdivision. And let me just quickly show you why. So I've created this new cube, and I'm just going to move it out of place here. Let's get up a bit. So subdivision means that we take a mesh and we split each of the faces uh, twice. So we essentially end up with four times the geometry. And one really nice property of subdivision is that no matter if we have quads like this, or if we have triangles such as this, or even if we have, let's say, a face with five vertices on it, if we subdivide this mesh, so let's say you build a volume out of some kind of geometry, and if you then subdivide this mesh, so it's subdivision here, everything will be turned into quads. So the triangles turn into quads. And this big n-gon over here, this five-sided polygon, uh, also gets turned into equally distributed quads. To manually unwrap a model like this, what I would usually start out doing is 
doing a projection of some sort. So either a planar projection or a view projection, just so that all of the faces are represented inside of the UV space. So once we have some sort of UVs, we can then select all of the edges and cut the UVs by the edges. In my case, I'm using a hotkey here. Um, once they're cut, we can unfold them or relax them um, so that all of the faces are separated from each other. So once they're separated, we can align them and we can use a function called rectangle, which will force the UVs to be rectangles. But they're still a bit all over the place. So next up, I will align them. So first aligning them vertically and then aligning them horizontally. So they're all centered and they're all rectangles. So once we have them like this, all we need to do now is to select all of these, stretch them out and just flatten these by scaling them and then snapping them to the, to the borders of the UV. <clears throat> so I'll do the same for this one and I'll scale it. And then grabbing these, scaling it and moving it. And same for this one. So effectively now all of our UVs are unwrapped individually to use the full UV space. So this is a really quick way if you want to do it inside of a 3D modeling software. Um, however, I made this one inside of ZBrush and I'll show you why that is a really nice approach. So let me open up ZBrush here and I've got the tree in here as well. So as you can see, I've sculpted these pieces and when you sculpt this geometry, you can really go crazy with your style. You can experiment a lot. And once we have this mesh looking the way we want it to, uh, we can then use a feature in ZBrush called C Remesher. So inside of ZBrush, under Geometry, we have this thing called C Remesher. And C Remesher takes whatever geometry you have and creates a quadrangulated mesh from it. So in here we have a few options, and one being the adaptive size, and the adaptive size uh, tells ZBrush um, how much it should tolerate rectangles, so whether or not we allow it to create long, thin triangles. And in my case, I've just set this to zero. Feel free to experiment with this. There's also a target polygon count, meaning how, how many triangles do you want to end up with? And obviously, the higher the, the polygon count, the more expensive the mesh will be to render. So feel free to experiment with this as well. So I'm just gonna hit zero measure. And it takes my sculpt and it creates this nicely, um, nicely distributed quad mesh. So one more nice thing about ZBrush is the way we can unwrap this in the way that the shader wants this. So again, in ZBrush, there is under UV map, we have the option to create a new UV map for this. So under UV map and create, there is a thing called the UV tile. And clicking this creates a new UV that places these exactly how we want them. And it's kind of hard to preview this in ZBrush, but if we click this morph UV button, the faces will be morphed into their corresponding UV position, giving us an indication that the UVs are laid out correctly. I've got this new project set up with uh, just these two models and a direction light in it that I will be using to try out our new shader while we build it. And I'm going to start by creating the, the actual shader by right clicking inside of the project and going to create and I'm going to make an amplify surface shader for this and let's name this foliage uh, shader and we're also going to need a material that is using this shader so I'm going to right click once again and go to create and take material and let's name this foliage 01 
we also need to make sure that this new material is actually using the foliage shader. So up here in the material, uh, we can change the shader to foliage shader. There we go. I also need to make sure that the models are using the new material. So I'm going to drag drop these onto here, like so. And now we're good to go. The data that we'll be using will be the actual UVs on the vertices. And in order to access those, we need to grab a node called vertex text cord. So this one contains the U and V coordinates for each vertex. And just to visualize what this data looks like, I'm going to plug this into the emission channel. And I'm going to hit compile. So looking at the model now, we can see that each of these quads is using the zero to one in UV space. So the red one is the U uh, axis and the green one is the V axis. We can also think of these as X and Y. And I'm going to use this data to create a vertex offset. If you've never done a vertex shader before or played around with vertex offsets, you can think of it as a way for the shader to change the position of a vertex before it's being drawn onto the screen. So the shader has access to all the information about the models that are being drawn onto the screen. But before actually drawing out the triangles as pixels, it has the ability to manipulate those values, uh, effectively just moving the vertices. And the best way to visualize this is to just create a new vector. So I'm, I'm going to create a vector three. So three values. And this is exactly the same as um, you would use position in your scene. So you have the X, Y, and Z value. And I'm just going to plug this directly into the local vertex offset. And if we want to change these values in the material itself, we also need to make sure that this vector is not a constant, but it's actually a property. So looking up in the left corner here, we can see that this one is set to be a constant. So changing this to be a property, and we can name it something just so uh, that we can see it more clearly. So I'm going to call this offset and I'm going to hit compile. So, so far nothing has happened and that's because our offset is set to zero. But if I select our material, you can see in the inspector now we have this um, option here called offset. And if I change one of these values, so let's say I change this X value, you can see that the vertices appears to move to the side here. And we can also change the Y value and the Z value. But the cool thing about a vertex shader is that the underlying model is actually intact. And in Unity, we can see this quite clearly if we select the model. So we can see here that the outline um, is outlining the original model, whereas the geometry being drawn out is offset to the side here. But I'm going to get rid of this because we're not going to do it this way. However, we are going to use these UV text cord, uh, this vertex text cord to drive the offset. So what would happen if we just plug this directly into the local vertex offset? Let's give it a go. So looking at the model now, it sort of already looks like the thing we're going for. We have each of these quads more or less facing towards us. So what's actually happening here is that for each vertex, it's looking up its UV value. And if the UV is set to zero, like it is here, you can see that it stayed in place. This is actually matching the outline here. So this is the original location of the vertex, whereas uh, where the vertex is, uh, where the UV is green, for instance, 
uh, it has moved one unit in the y-axis and where it is red it has moved one unit in the x-axis. So this is sort of what we'll be doing. However, if we look, if we zoom out a bit, we can see that the everything is kind of going diagonally upwards. And the reason for that is because we're adding one in x and one in y. So we're effectively moving it up and right. So the first thing we need to do is to make sure that the, um, the lower left corner wouldn't stay in its place, that it, but rather going uh, left and downwards instead. So we need to remap this value. So currently the UV goes from zero to one, but what we want to do is that we want um, the right-hand side to go as it is now, but the left-hand side should go in the opposite direction, so negative one. The easiest way to do that is by using a remap node. So I'm going to type in remap and grab one of those. So the remap node, it takes a value and it scales it. So we can say what the, uh, what the old minimum value is, and then we can set a new minimum value effectively uh, stretching the vertex. So I'm going to plug this UV in here. And by default, the remap node, when it's added a second um, channel here, it actually didn't fill in the same value as the first one was. So we can see here the maximum old is set to one for the X, but zero for this. So we want the maximum old to be one. So the old value should be the value that we currently have. So we have UV that goes from zero to one in both X and Y, but the new minimum value, instead of being zero, we want this to go towards negative one and same with the Y to negative one. Um, and the max value should still be one. So we need to make sure that this one is one as well like so. And let's plug this in. So now we can see that the uh, the quads are um, equally distributed to um, the top and to the side. So it's no longer pointing towards the top right. So again, this looks sort of what we're going for. However, if I turn the camera, you can see that it's not actually caring about the camera. It's just pointing um, locally up and to the right. It doesn't, it doesn't know anything about the camera. So the next thing we're going to do is to force these to look towards the camera. To make the quads face the camera, we're going to take our UV-based offset and we're going to transform it so that it is relative to the view of the camera, which is also referred to as view space. To do this, I'm going to grab a node called view matrix. The view matrix holds information about the camera that is currently rendering the scene, or rather it holds the position and orientation of the inverse of the camera, uh, meaning what the camera is currently seeing. If we multiply our UVs with the view matrix, we're effectively transforming them to the view space. So I'm going to add a multiply node, this one. And I'm going to multiply this scaled UV with the view matrix. However, this will not quite work. So looking at it now, we can see that it's doing something. It sort of shifts a bit in place. But the reason this is not working is because 
the vector we plugged in is a 2D vector. We only have the u and the v value. So we need to make sure that this is actually a 3D vector. And to do that, I'm going to use a append node. So right click and type append. So I want to create a vector three. So in the node itself, we can set the vector type. It's by default, it's set to vector four, but we're going for a vector three. And I'm going to plug in the scaled UV and automatically it fills the X and Y value. However, the Z value is set to zero. And that's exactly what we want. Uh, just be zero because we're not interested in the Z value. Um, and we can see now that the lines going into this node has two lines, meaning it's two values coming in. But when we grab it from this side, we can see three values going out. So we've effectively turned our 2D vector into a 3D vector. So once I plug this in here and hit compile, these are now facing the camera. So this is exactly the effect we're going for. However, uh, there is one little problem with this, or actually two little problems with this. Um, the reason this is actually working now is because I haven't changed the rotation of this. So let's say I spin this. Now we're always facing the side of the quad. The reason this is happening is because our offset is being applied relative to the orientation of the tree model itself, which is known as object space or local space. To fix this, we need to take our offset and transform it so that it's using the object's orientation in the scene instead, which is known as world space. The easiest way to do this is to grab another matrix node. And I'm going to use one called the object to world, uh, object to world matrix. And same as before, I'm going to multiply this, uh, our vector with this new matrix. And I'm going to create another multiply node. We can do this uh, quickly by just holding down M and clicking. So I'm going to grab this and I'm going to multiply it with a vector, uh, with a matrix. And I'm going to plug this into the local vertex offset. So the effect is now supporting rotation. So no matter how I rotate this, uh, all the quads are always facing the camera. However, once again, we've, we've missed one little thing. So what would happen if I scale this model? So you can see that the quads are not consistent when we scale this object. And that is due to the, uh, the length of this vector. So in order to make this vector a uniform length, um, so it doesn't go off like this when we scale it, I'm going to use a normalize node. So I'm going to right click, I'm going to type normalize. And I'm going to plug this in. So now the tree supports rotation and it also supports scaling. So this means that the camera effect is now actually working. So let's get rid of this UV in emission and let's instead use this um, PBR material that we've already have set up here. So I'm going to create an albedo value by creating a vector five, which is used for colors. So I'm going to hold down five and I'm just going to click. So this is a vector five and we can set it to a color. So I'm going to pick some sort of green shade for this. Um, the alpha is actually irrelevant, but I like seeing the color in this uh, viewer here. 
Um, so yeah, let's just go for some shade of green and plug this into the albedo. So what we're seeing now is the quads are pick, um, they keep the original lighting that the underlying mesh had. So to visualize this, I'm going to create this blend effect that I had in my, uh, in my own example so that we can switch between the billboard version and the non-billboard version. And all we need to do for that is to create a lerp. So I'm gonna hit lerp. So the lerp is just um, two values uh, that we blend linearly by plugging in a third value that controls which one of the two values we see or how much of each of these two we see. Uh, by plugging in a value between 0 and 1. So when this is set to 1, I want to see this effect. And when it's set to 0, I want the offset to be 0, which we already have here. And I'm just going to uh, create a value that controls this alpha. I'm going to hold down 1, and I'm going to click. So we'll get a float. And just like before, I don't want this to be a constant. I want to be able to access this inside of the material. So I'm going to change this from a constant to be a property. And I'm going to call this um, effect blend. Like so. And I'm going to plug this in as the alpha. Um, I also want to make sure that this value, when we slide it, it won't go below zero and it won't go above one. And in Amplify, if we want to make sure that a uh, property stays within range, we can set a minimum and a maximum value. But if both of these are set to zero, it means that we can slide it however we, um, however we like. So we need to set a maximum value here. So I'm going to set this to one. And you can see this instantly updates to a slider. So let's just plug this back in and set the default to one and compile. So selecting the material now, we have this sli slider called Effect Blend. And if I slide this towards zero, we can now switch between the initial model without the offset and the billboard effect with the full offset. So the really cool thing about this method is that uh, if we look at this value that we have here, like for instance, let's look at this um, dark quad down here. Once I slide this, actually it went hidden but, hidden, but the quad itself keeps the shading from the quad, um, from the original mesh. So with vertex shader, this is actually a positive side effect because whenever we change the position in a vertex shader, we don't update the normals by default. So if we would like the billboards to um, get their shading as if they were actually placed the way they are on screen, we need to do that calculation ourselves. Uh, but in this case, we don't want that. We want the original shading. So this is just, this is perfect as it is. However, uh, we might want to make this look less blocky. So I'm going to add a alpha to this. So I've already prepared an alpha that I've used in my own trees. And the reason this is red and not white, black and white, is because it's set to be a single channel, meaning I get the red channel. So uh, think of this as a black and white image being our alpha. So I'm just going to drag drop this in here. And I'm going to plug this into the opacity mask. However, this shader does not yet support um, alpha. So I'm going to select the shader and under render queue, I'm going to change this to be alpha test. So now we have the option to set an opacity mask. We also have a few extra uh, options that are only for transparent object, not the alpha test object. So I'm also going to change the render type 
to be transparent cutout. So now we only have the opacity mask available. So I'm going to grab this red channel and I'm going to plug it into the opacity mask. Um, and the reason it didn't update is because these texture samples are by default a property, meaning that the material can override this um, the texture that we have set inside of the shader itself. So we need to go to the material and we need to set this texture in the material as well. There we go. So as soon as we apply the alpha, it instantly gets really fussy. Um, it's also worth pointing out that something I've noticed with the alpha is that it really helps a lot to have um, quite a high frequency of detail. So uh, we have a lot of space in between. As, as soon as it goes solid, uh, we get a lot of the strange overlaps that we had before we applied the alpha. So when you make your alpha, think, make sure you uh, keep some space between the uh, leaves just to give it this fussiness because it helps hiding the fact that it's a billboard. So just one quick note on the shading. Since it's picking up the shading of the object, the really cool thing about this is that in order to change the overall style and look of this, all we need to do is um, change the underlying material, like ignoring the fact that it's doing this effect and just apply uh, stuff like uh, for instance, smoothness. Let's add a bit of smoothness. So I'm going to create a float holding down one and clicking. And I'm going to change this to be a property. And let's just call this smoothness and plug it into smoothness. And as soon as we crank up the smoothness, you can see that we get this specular highlight on the model. So already we're getting some sort of style going here. We could also, for instance, add the Fresnel effect. So I'm going to add a Fresnel node. Uh, worth noting with the Fresnel node is that it doesn't automatically output a black and white value. So by default, this will go really bright, but I'm going to plug this into the emission just to show you what's going to happen. And it goes super bright. So the Fresnel, we need to make sure that it stays between zero and one. And we can do that by adding a saturate node. So if you haven't used saturate, this is a clamp node. So it cuts off, uh, it's a clamp node, but it's set to be only between zero and one. So any value below zero will be zero. Any value above one will be one. So it just cuts off the uh, the low end and the high end. So I'm going to saturate this. Didn't actually do that much. Um, I'm also going to multiply this by a color. So just another multiply node and another color node, holding down five. And I'm going to set this to some different shade of green. And plug this back in. So this way we can quickly uh, add a lot of style to our um, trees. So already it's starting to look like something from a, um, like a Studio Ghibli film or something. Uh, we can also look at this thing. The cool thing about this shader is that as long as the object is unwrapped the way it is, we can grab basically any model with this setup. So for instance, if we have a model like this, we could add our foliage shader to it and it automatically just becomes foliage. Um, there are two more things I want to quickly show you before I end this video. 
So this effect, the camera facing effect, let's say we want to change the size of these. So each of these quads, actually let's change this to shader wireframe so we can look at the quads like this. So we know that each of these are the size of the UV. They're like negative one and one. So these are uh, two in size. If we would like to change the size of these, all we need to do is to take this vector and multiply it by a single value and that will change the scale of it. So I'm going to add a multiply node at the end of this um, chain here. So multiply. And I'm going to set this to use a single value. And again, I'm going to make this a property. And let's call this um, billboard size. And by default, it should be set to, whoops, not the max, the default, it should be set to one, just so uh, if we don't change this in the material, it will be the, it will be an appropriate value. So now if we click the material, we can set the, uh, the scale or the billboard size by just changing this value. Another quite cool thing that we can do with this is that um, same way that we're changing the size of these, we can also change how close to the original surface they are. Because currently these are placed at the position of the original vertices. But since all of the quads have their own normals, we can use the normals in order to um, inflate the model, in order to push the vertices away in the direction they're facing. So let me just make a bit of space here. We access the normals of the vertices by right clicking and typing vert and norm, normal. So vertex normal. Um, so this is a vector describing the normal of the vert. Basic in this case, it's pointing outwards from the face. So if we take this value and we can multiply it to say how far we want to push the billboard away from the surface uh, by adding a single value. So changing this to again, a property and let's call this uh, inflate and multiply this value. Um, I'm going to let the default be zero because perhaps we don't want to use this all the time, but um, so here we have the scaled normal. If we add this to the billboard, we're essentially just moving the billboard in the direction of the normal. So I'm going to add a add node, holding down a click to add an add node. So adding this value here and plugging it in here and hit compile. We now have an option to uh, inflate the model. So let's set the size back to one. So it doesn't go crazy. And now we can push the faces, uh, push the billboards away from the faces in order to inflate the model. Uh, we could also push them inwards, but you'll notice that the shading looks a bit messed up because the uh, the faces that are on the other side of the mesh getting a different lighting will push through to the other side, um, essentially just inverting the mesh. Um, one thing that I would like to add that I think is really cool with this method is that since we are just using the UVs in this case to uh, manipulate the vertices, anything that we can do to regular UV coordinates, we can do to manipulate the billboard itself. So just to visualize this, I'm going to change this to shader wireframe again. 
and just zooming in here looking at these so for instance one thing that is very common to use when uh, doing vfx manipulating the vert uh, the uv coordinates is for instance using a rotator so let me just add one of those so a rotator um, so the rotator takes the uvs and given an anchor and the time the time in this case being uh, the amount of rotation will rotate the uv uh, around this pivot point by this much so in our case um, the original center of the uv chords is 0.5 and 0.5 but since we've already remapped those we know that in this case where the maximum is one and the minimum is negative one the pivot point will be at zero. So I'm gonna plug this value as my UV, leaving the anchor at zero and zero. And just like this one suggests, I'm gonna add some time to this. So right click and hit time. And this is not how I would actually use it by just plugging time into it, but I just wanna show you what this will do. So plugging time in and then plugging it back into the chain here and hitting compile. So rotating the UVs in this case doesn't mean rotating the texture inside of the quad. It means actually rotating the billboard. So in my example, um, I'm using this effect to uh, for my wind effect to get this uh, jittering effect. So that's essentially um, using a rotator uh, and instead of just plugging in time I'm plugging in the amount of rotation so I'm using a sine wave to basically wobble these quickly uh, as the wind passes through um, but I will not go through the wind setup in this one however if you would like to see it um, I could perhaps do another tutorial if people would be interested to see how we could do a wind setup for this To conclude this video, I would like to clarify that this technique is not a one-size-fits-all solution for making foliage. It doesn't replace the traditional way of creating foliage where you make more branch-like cards and manually attach them to the tree trunk. Billboards are limited in the way that they're always facing the camera, giving them an odd behavior when you're moving the camera around quickly. They lend themselves better to more abstract art styles where the expression of the tree is more important than the accuracy and the overall level of detail. I'm personally very excited for this technique though, uh, mainly because it requires so little manual setup once you have your shader. The low complexity of this approach makes it very easy to experiment with your style um, especially when you can almost instantly go from a sculpt to a finished tree. It's also very quick to experiment with the style of the leaves, since it's just using a single circular alpha texture. Thank you so much for watching. Um, I hope you found this video helpful in some way. I'm looking forward to see what others can do with this technique, as I'm sure there are more use cases for it. And let me know if anything is unclear, and I can hopefully clarify it in the comments. Bye!